Whoa, very good. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. So this is our scenario. The chief information security officer walks in and starts warning about the terrible vulnerabilities, the threats to your web application. The web application can be hacked easily. Data can be stolen. It can be corrupted. It can be ransomed. And something has to be done. It's a threat to the whole company. Now, the CEO hears this, but he has other problems. He's got to increase sales. He says, this is a startup. Startups usually fail. And if we don't increase sales, we're going to fail. I cannot devote all the resources to implementing proper security techniques, says the CEO. Yes, this, uh, this chief information security officer is really upset, but a lot of other people are upset as well. There are customers out there. We all want a quick solution, quick and easy, quick and dirty, not putting in the effort. Here's a solution, web application firewall. So the CEO hears is this thing that you slap in front of your web application and it handles web security for you. Problem solved, take a budget, go away, put up the WAF, we don't have time to do anything else. That's the scenario. I've seen it many times in my job, which I'll tell you about in a minute. In fact, I'll tell you about a lot of things in this hour, including what a WAF is, how it works technically, and why it doesn't work. I'll explain false positives, false negatives, and I'll even talk about some scenarios where a WAF is valuable. So if I haven't answered those questions yet, I will in the next 38 minutes and seven seconds. Our talk today is called No WAFs. Don't use a web application firewall, and when you should use one anyway. I'm Joshua Fox. I'm a senior cloud architect at Doit. My email address, easy to remember, joshua at doit.com. Send photos of me to that address, and of course, contact me with questions. I'd love to hear from you. Um, of course, you can also ask questions at the end of this hour. So what I do on a daily basis is advise customers on Google Cloud, AWS, and to a lesser extent on Azure. So it's a, do it as an independent company, but we collaborate with these companies. I'm also a Google developer expert, which means I'm one of a group of non-Google employees that Google thinks can go around the world and talk about Google products. Now I will focus on the Google WAF, which I'll tell you about but everything I say is equally applicable to really any WAF. Well, maybe I'll even mention the other offerings a little bit as well from other companies. Do it as a company. Well, I, as part of Do It, give advice to tech companies on architecture, security cost optimization, or if there's some terrible bug or problem in their infrastructure, I di dive deep and solve problems for experts about their three clouds. Do it as a company does that, but we also have software that detects and helps analyze cost, helps lower cost, and in general, make your cloud experience better. Oh, I, when I uh, accepted for B-sides, I realized that a lot of the talks were in French. Uh, I don't know French. I've actually been studying a language for the last three years, which is native to Alsace, which is Yiddish. Yes, this is actually quite surprising. We think of Yiddish as Eastern European, but it had its origins right here about a thousand years ago. But then I thought, well, maybe the audience wouldn't understand me despite the fact that Yiddish comes from Alsace. So yes, I will be talking in English today. This talk is based on an article I wrote. So at the end of the talk, I'll show you an easy way to access these very slides, which are public. And also in that, you can see a link to my article. This talk goes way into more depth than the article. And the reason it does, and this is maybe one of the few talks I've given in conferences that is this style of talk, which is a rant. In other words, it is about experiences I've had where I've seen people do things wrong, and I feel a real need to correct something, and I'll, of course, I'll explain why in great technical detail. What is a WAF? A WAF is a service that tries to protect your web application. 
We'll get into architecture and functionality later. But it stands in front of your web application logically, and it is going to block various types of attacks. Why do companies choose to get a WAF? What are the drivers? I hinted at it a few minutes later. Let's talk more specifically. Hacker attack. Oh no, there's a hacker. We see it in the logs. Somebody's trying to get in. Somebody did get in. Fire drill, everybody run around screaming. When in trouble or in doubt, run in circles, scream, and shout. So what do you do in such a situation? You get a WAF. You pay to have this protection to try to keep those hackers out even though they may already be in. Another driver is similar. Companies choose a WAF because of a penetration test. That's like a hacker, except you paid them to hack you. And it is so easy to break into most web apps. All those web apps you see from different companies, it is scary. I had penetration testers, good people. They, they weren't evil hackers, but they would find all sorts of vulnerabilities in a web app that I was responsible for as an architect. I handed them over to another team with another web app. Yes, they broke in there too. Very, very fast. And when that happens, what do you do? WAF. The driver for WAF is usually a state of urgency. We need a solution now. Quick and easy. Somebody else do this for me. I'd rather, and this usually makes sense, I'd rather pay someone else to do it than develop the advanced security skills that I need to implement my own solution and do this properly. The problem with that is that you will never develop the expertise for doing this correctly in-house. Because if you think that this is a temporary solution and later on you're going to rework your entire buggy web app, no, you won't. <laughs> there are always more bigger priorities which usually involve selling because that's why a company exists. So that is the real risk of, the, the, of, a, web, of a web application firewall. Uh, so another reason that companies adopt a WAF is outside requirements are, which are usually accompanied by an audit checking those. Now this could be the government which decides, well, you just need a WAF and that's it. Um, by the way, you all see that there, good. You need a WAF. It could be a customer who has this long request for proposals and says WAF is a requirement. It could be partners that you work with, you collaborate a big with a big company, they don't know you, but they say you need a WAF for security. Or a standards body, this is related, but you have these ISO, all sorts of, you know, all sorts of requirements and you want to sign off, maybe, maybe it says WAF. Can't argue with that. But the real driver for a WAF, the real reason people adopt WAFs is security blanket. Makes you feel good. Oh, we did something. We didn't neglect security. Those are the drivers for a WAF. But let's talk about the threats that you're protecting against. The uh, canonical list is called OWASP. It's uh, one of these industry bodies. Top 10 are the most biggest threats. Those could be because not necessarily because the most dangerous, because almost any one of these threats can be dangerous, but because they're w in wide use. So you can click later on the link and see what those are. Let's walk through one of these vulnerabilities called cross-site scripting. Now, I use this as an example, probably too much, because it's a famous and easy one to talk about. There are hundreds and thousands of possible attacks besides the OWASP top 10. I set this up as a real live demo, nowaf.joshuafox.com with WAF, I'll explain the architecture in a minute. So this is real, although I put it in slides for, to allow us to move uh, faster through the example. But yeah, these are screenshots from an actual walkthrough. So this is actually Scrabble in Yiddish, which I developed as an open source. And let's say you're creating a game and you're a hacker. So you write down the name of your innocent victims, whose first name is Innocent. And that's an actual name. There were some popes called Innocent. But then their last name is Victim. But your name is this thing, script alert, hack you script, that's your name? Well, of course, that's a piece of JavaScript. And uh, what this uh, JavaScript does if, if things go wrong is pop up an alert that says, hacked you, but that's just an example to keep it simple. In real life, it would do something far worse, such as stealing your password. It's JavaScript. It lives in the browser, and it will steal your password or do anything else. The demo, the demo architecture, which you can try now until I take it down, I don't know, at some point, uh, has a single server and a load balancer um, without cloud armor and one with cloud armor for protection. So we have this 
web application, and when you access it, you're actually accessing the same thing. One is has a shield in front of it, an armor, and the other does not. So what is the danger here of cross-site scripting? Well, in the proper code, the, the person's name is appended into a chat log. You can send to each other's chats just communicating. And there's this div, which is actually a JavaScript function that makes it safe by, es by escaping it. Uh, just one minute. Yeah, you hear me? Good. So that's the safe one. I broke the code on purpose, and I just put, as you see in the bottom, I put the name right in there into the chat. So there's a chat. And remember, that's not a name. It's this weird JavaScript, fake name. Now, this goes to the, in I send the innocent victim a message, and it says Joshua sent you a message, but it doesn't say Joshua. It says this weird thing. And because the code is wrongly written, it actually runs JavaScript, which in the bad case would steal, steal your password. So now, what if you have, uh, that was without a WAF, of course. What if you have a WAF for protection? Looks good. So this is actually exactly the same. And when I send a chat to my victim, as you see here, the URL is with WAF. The WAF sees that weird little JavaScript thing instead of my name, and it blocks it. Well, that's good. It's a crude weapon, though. You want anyone to see this for it to be forbidden? I mean, that's not good code. Oh, you can hide it using Ajax, but this is a crude weapon. It just whacks the attack with a hammer. Better than not whacking the attack, but far better would be if you just don't let it happen. That was cross-site scripting. Let's take another quick example. Now, I, I can't show you all the hundreds and thousands of types of possible attacks, but this one is fun. SQL injection. So the mother gets a, this is an XKCD comic. The mother gets a call from your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. She says, oh dear, did he break something? Well, in a way, did you really name your son Robert, apostrophe, right parentheses, semicolon, drop table, student, semicolon, dash, dash? And she says, oh yes, little Bobby Tables, we call him. Well, we've lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And she says, I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. The attack here is quite similar to what I showed you earlier with cross-site scripting. We, we have some SQL somewhere down deep that says, insert into the student's table this person's first and last name. But when you open that up, this Bobby Table's name, his name is values Robert da da da. If you see what that does, it inserts Robert, which is good, but then it drops the table students. It actually runs that, wipes out the whole table. Quite similar to cross-site scripting. So those were two attacks. A third attack is called distributed denial of service. And that's where the attacker just hammers you with lots of requests. One interesting question is why DDoS, why distributed? Why can't they just hammer you with attacks without being distributed across many computers that work together to hammer you? Well, it's distributed across many attackers because if it's just one, then it's just a fight, an, a fair fight between two computers, the attacker and you. And who's to say who's stronger? Maybe your server won't crash, but if they can get thousands of zombie computers to do a distributed attack, they can take you down. The worst type of threat, though, and I'm going to finish the list of threats with this, is application level. That's in your code. Your code is broken. Incorrect authorization. You probably have written, you wrote a few pages for your web app. I don't know many, three, 10, 100 in PHP, Java, whatever it is. Do you have authorization? Or can the authorization be bypassed, for example, in search, which typically searches masses of text and in some big, dump of text, do you really know who's allowed to look at which zip zip? Well, it's, it's doable, but did you do it? So let's talk, toss in a WAF and see how it works. Cloud Armor is an example, they're all quite similar. So we have a backend service, which might be a virtual machine serving a server, or it could be an external application, it could be Kubernetes, many things. And there's a load balancer in front. So this is quite normal. And the load balancer in many cases has to decrypt your HTTPS anyway to make routing decisions. So you add into it Cloud Armor. So it peeks at the request, which again has been decrypted, and it makes that decision and possibly blocks the whole request. It's organized into policy, and policy has many rules. I'll talk more about what a rule looks like. And the rules are prioritized. Which one comes first? Maybe a rule says you're forbidden, but there's a higher priority rule that says you're allowed. So those have a priority. Rules are built like this. There's a match condition. 
that says, we see some cross-site scripting, we see some DDoS, that's the condition, and then you decide what to do based on that condition. Now, some examples are obviously to deny the request, you saw that, 403 denied. You might say to allow it. Maybe you have a rule which is actually positive. It says we see whatever. I'll talk more about those examples. We see the whatever, and so we're going to allow this through. Or it could say just log it. Say we don't, we don't really know what to do, but we do want to see uh, what's going on today, what potential attacks exist, so the rule has an action which could be to simply log. Let's talk about the types of rules. Earlier I talked about types of attacks, and this somewhat... Uh, in some cases, corresponds to the type of rules. Uh, IP address. What if you see an attacker is coming from one IP address, and you say, oh no, we're going to not let anyone through if they come from that IP address. Or you could say the opposite. You could say, we work with bu business to business partners, so we're going to whitelist just their office, or just their servers, and everything else is going to be blocked. This is quite similar to firewalls, or what you might know in Amazon as network access control list or security groups. The difference is that this is on the edge. It's calculated way before the request gets into your virtual private cloud, into your own network in the cloud. Geography. So you might say, we only work with customers from France who are a French company. Just we're going to block anybody from any other country. Or you might say, it looks like hackers are coming from this country. Oh no. We're under attack, let's block this country, this entire country. That's actually related to IP address, but there are databases out there, often erroneous, that say which countries the attack, uh, the attack might be coming from. The other type of rule, which is the most complex, which is, has the richest discussion, is HTTP content scan. So that's where it actually looks inside and says, this is an SQL injection, let's see. Let's look at these rules that dig into the body of the request and look at that suspicious string inside it. These are some pre-configured rules from Cloud Armor into categories of SQL injection, cross-site scripting, other types of attacks. This is a tiny, tiny selection of a huge collection of such rules, and they come into different versions. Why this complexity of versions? Because everything's always shifting and changing. And you want to be very careful when you use a new version of rules because you might be blocking the wrong thing. We'll talk about that. So this is not simple. There's no one magic thing that says bad, good, doesn't exist. So these are pre-configured rules that you should use because some really smart people figured out what attacks look like. They're not perfect, neither are you, but they worked on thousands of rules. But you can write your own. In addition, parent sensitivity levels are defined, paranoia. You might uh, say, let's make this super sensitive because I'm really worried about attacks. But then you might block desired requests. Or you might say, uh, let's, let's just be cool about it and let through many requests, but then you might uh, let through the attackers. So if we dig down into SQL injection, we see this is not simple. You saw little bobby tables earlier. But there are, again, hundreds of rules, SQL injection, that common database names. Earlier, we saw the database name was students, or the table name was students. There are many common database names in this database. Other tricky things that I won't talk about, that it scans the request to look for. This is a tiny sample. And now if we dig down, <laughs> we see a signature that talks about benchmark and sleep. Now, my purpose of putting on this slide is that you don't read it. This is supposed to scare you. People worked very hard on this, and that is a regular expression, but boy, is that complicated. A lot of annotations, tags, explaining what this is out of hundreds and hundreds of such sample signatures. Now, if that looks too complicated for you, you can write your own rules. Here's the rule language. You say, let's look at the header, your user agent, and see if it's WordPress, case in sense. A regular expression, you probably recognize that. That's pretty simple, but you think you're smart? Well, you are a smart person but there are hundreds more to be considered and thought of. So that's why I recommend that you use pre-configured rules. All this said about how a WAF works, it won't protect you. It will not give you what you think it will give you. The first risk is blocking your own app. Let's say that your app is a software engineering forum like Stack Overflow. Or in a real case, let's say it's a bug reporting app. So I did this. 
I wrote a bug report saying there was a discussion of cross-site scripting, and the customer said, and then I said, and I gave a little snippet of JavaScript because I was discussing that as a bug. Well, what happened? I hit enter, and it, the app was broken. It couldn't accept my bug report because I had a snippet of JavaScript. Of course, that's what you do in bug reports, right? You discuss JavaScript. So yeah, it was blocking my own thing. So it could be blocking your users. Think of how product managers are so concerned about every user. They want more users and more users and more users. And you just block the user, and they're really confused about why you blocked your application. Another example is a big discussion forum and somebody discusses credit card, that's a sample number, it's not real, there's no fraud here, but the application decides it's a credit card number because of the structure, because it is a valid card number, but not of an actual card. Oops, now nobody can see the whole page. Imagine Reddit or whatever forum, the whole page wiped out for everyone because one person wrote this, they can actually attack you that way. So even worse is if your application passes executable code on purpose, I've seen applications that pass around a JavaScript from one client to another just to do something. Boy, is that dangerous. It, there's two things here. One is that it's dangerous because then anyone can pass any JavaScript around from browser to browser and attack another browser. But you can't stop that now. You cannot put in a WAF because you put in <laughs> a dangerous thing. The dangerous thing is part of your application. Yes, I've seen it happen. But in the end, you've seen how complex these rules are. They're not perfect, and you could be blocking desired users. Here's another example, which involves DDoS. You see those spikes? Does that look like DDoS to you? So let's block it. Actually, this is the Australian Tennis Open. Once a year, they have a big tennis match, and if you block the big spikes, you block the entire purpose of your web application. So you have to think about that false positive. Now, the truth is that uh, the WAF people have thought about this, and there are ways to deal with this. One is you just plan in advance to not do that blocking. The other is that there are machine learning driven features that kind of learn that this is not as suspicious as it could be. Machine learning is not perfect. Machine learning by its very nature is imprecise. It kind of figures out patterns. It's not hard and fast rules. So machine learning is not going to 100% save you by its very nature. So you could block an IP addresses but what if there are many users behind network address translation that share an IP address? Now you've blocked your desired users. Likewise with the block of addresses. If you see attackers coming from country X, not Thailand, <laughs> the actual example encountered was a different country. Don't want to put down any one country, but you say, oh no, attackers. Do you really want to stop all customers in that country? Maybe you don't have any customers there today, but it's a growth opportunity you just blocked. So the most important thing here to solve all this is a security mindset. You need to think security at all times. And since every company is imperfect and you don't have perfect security, what's the number one thing that means is you need a person in charge. It could be a chief information security officer, but it could be an architect. When I say in charge, I don't mean they're going to fix things. On the contrary, but they're the one you go to and they'll tell you, oh, you know, there's a problem. Another solution for all this is called dry run or preview, which is logging only. So you set it up so that uh, it looks like this is a denial, but actually you see it's preview. And that means that it just logs every single thing. And then you come back a week later and you say, oh, there have been no false positives and other logs that tell me there was an attack detected. And you say, okay, now I can do it for real. I've seen companies go for years scared to turn on the for real. Because do you know that every little thing in the log is maybe part of your application's correct behavior. Maybe in another week something will happen that's part of your desired behavior. Are you really sure? Is this guesswork? Unless you're really comfortable with your application, you might be afraid to turn it on. Living with that uncertainty. So dry run is only a partial solution. The opposite, the flip side of false positives is false negatives, le letting the attackers through. Regexes are limited as a language, as you know from college. And they ha have to be fast because, as I said, there are hundreds of these regular expressions. So typically only a few kilobytes are scanned. The attacker just needs to have a big, big HTTP request and put the attack after that. That is a straight up weakness that every attacker knows. There's, there's nothing to get around that. The worst thing, as I said, is if you, you have an application with broken access control. Did you really check that every page has a password protection when it needs to? 
Have you checked that every page that you gave someone access to that they should be allowed to write, to read? Uh, maybe you did, because you're smart people. But no WAF can protect that. They don't know what your application logic is. Worse, attackers are smart. They're always shifting. They can uh, use a different country with a VPN. They can do a different attack. Or they can realize that an attack is being blocked by regex. Because remember, these regexes are part of an open initiative of OS. And they can just make a tiny little change in the string. There are smart people out there. You have to be smart people. They are always scheming. WAFs have predefined rules. Attacks are not predefined. Now again, machine learning can be flexible, but it's not infinitely smart either. It's not infinitely smart. And also, machine learning, as I said, by its nature, is looking at patterns and not 100%. How else do we deal with the balance between false positives and false negatives? As it's called, recall and precision. You want to find all the attacks and block them, but you don't want to falsely find non-attacks and block those. So when we see this happening, we look in the logs and say, oh no, I blocked the desired user. Oh no, I let a hacker through. The first thing we think is the rules aren't good. So we reconfigure the policy. So everything's configurable. We reconfigure the rules. That means, for example, you can choose to exclude a rule. You say, oh, that rule just blocked one of my users. I, I don't want that. I'm going to turn it off. Or you, you might look at a field. There are many HTTP header fields. I gave you the example of user agent before. You can say, let's not look at that field. You can choose a sensitivity level. Your product manager can say, I don't care. Stop blocking my users. So you say, let's make it less sensitive. Very easy. Just take it down from level three to two to one, whatever it is that you want. Or you can create rules. You can say, just let an attacker through. I'm going to write a new rule to block that. Or I'm going to write a rule which is an allow rule, the opposite of deny, that says, I know that these are desired users. You did that for that one hacker, that one desired user. Is your rule change really going to help achieve the balance? Remember, those really smart people at OWASP, the smart people at Google or AWS, uh, Cloud Shield, that's their WAF, thought long and hard about this balance. They have hundreds and hundreds of examples, thousands, millions of statistical data. You may think you have a special case because you're under stress because of the false positive or negative, but in fact, you're not special. <laughs> All the attackers out there know all this better than you do. Your application is just another app. Sorry, sorry to tell you that. It's just another application. And no matter how special it is, the attackers have a wide variety of attacks for what you believe to be a special case. Now, I might be wrong. And if your case really is special because your application is just this very unusual and one-of-a-kind thing, then you need to really look at that carefully and not just run to the WAF. Maybe your application is special because it's wrongly architected. You pass around live code from client to client. Yes, yes, people do this. And then you better fix that. So you cannot assume that that one rule that you put in for a special case, even though you're under pressure, is really going to help you very much. Job zero is a secure application that you are responsible for. Of course, I'm not going to explain here how you write a secure application in just a few minutes. But just to give a touch of one example, escape all strings. I showed you this earlier. In that function, div, that I showed you, it takes any string and it converts it from valid JavaScript into this escaped variant that will be correctly de de uh, deployed and presented in a browser but will never be executable. There is a function in the React framework called dangerously set inner HTML. Yes, they wrote, called it that because they know it's dangerous. You know what a, de what a developer does when they have some weird issue with escaping? I talked about escaping here. They have no idea what's going on. They're under pressure. The bug needs to fix. Yes, they go and they use this. And hey, it's fixed. And then all your escaping is not going to happen at all. Sanitizing is another solution that was described in the comic. It means deleting all the dangerous looking stuff. But do you really want to be deleting, just randomly deleting part of the uh, user's input? What if they were discussing
bugs, and they were discussing JavaScript. You can't just go wipe out everything the user types in because it looks a little suspicious. And that, too, will be imperfect, just as a WAF is imperfect. How do you detect potentially dangerous? You cannot just use these crude solutions and expect them to protect you. The WAF adds risk. Remember that a WAF is a man in the middle. It looks at unencrypted data, as I showed you earlier. What if it has a bug? But the biggest risk, as I said, is complacency. I like to compare the situation to a jewelry store with concrete walls, and it's got big holes in the walls. And then you say, let's put up a chicken wire fence around it. Uh, it's not perfect, but you know, better that than nothing. And I say, well, the fence is better than nothing. But you are forgetting you have big holes in the concrete, and that fence is not going to protect your jewelry store. A WAF also risks performance because it has to scan every request with thousands of rules. You know how hard you work to make your web application fast? This is going to slow it down. Some people ask me about pricing. Uh, now, there are different uh, pricing offers for the different competitors, so I won't get into that. But they can be very simple and based on just the rules. Maybe you only have a few rules. And how many requests? Or it can be enterprise style where you just pay a single monthly fee. And then if you protect hundreds of resources, hundreds of virtual machines, you pay for that. Like many cloud services, it's cheap if you start simple. But when you get up to enterprise level, let's say, then it gets expensive. So what is it good for at long last? We have relatively little time, and maybe I'm not going to talk so long about what it's good for, but it is good for some things. <laughs> One is what I mentioned earlier. If, you, if the customer says, you need a WAF, can't argue with the customer. Or what if the government says that? Or a partner of standards body? The thing is, then it's not actually a security requirement. It's not security. It's keeping them happy. Uh, maybe it's good for security, maybe it isn't, but that's not why you chose it. Okay. If you've installed a third-party app, such as a commercial one, or even open source, where realistically, when it comes to it, you're not going to fix the code from all its problems, maybe you want to throw a WAF in front of it. Still, complacency is a risk. It's also good if you have a very large organization and you have a central team that supervises the WAF. They see there's a new attack, like the famous Log4j, and they put in a solution. But the key point here is that it's a central team, and then they go nag the other teams, who, of course, are not going to work on it because they have other priorities, but allows the central team to supervise them and nag them until they fix it. Again, this is only half a security measure. What I've just showed you is an organizational measure for centralization. Now, if for some reason you know exactly what you want to block, I don't know why, like you say, oh, yes, exactly from this country, and I know that, you can block that country and use a WAF. The one go-to feature, which I do believe is useful, is DDoS protection. So that's, that's very real, and there are different ways to deal with DDoS, but uh, I actually support c companies just going to a WAF for DDoS. That still doesn't exempt you from working on it yourself. For example, if your application is so clumsy and uh, heavyweight and uses so much memory and CPU that five simultaneous requests will crash it, and yes, this happens, then someone can DDoS you by just hitting refresh in their browser. And then is that what you do with a WAF? You know what? A WAF won't even protect you from that because a WAF is looking for huge distributed denial of service. It's not looking for somebody hitting the refresh five times and crashing your badly written web application. So, very valuable for DDoS. Oh, sorry. When I keep saying that applications are badly written, I don't mean they all are, but I do mean that many are, and that's life. There are more advanced services that I haven't discussed now, but Google Cloud Armor offers this, and so does AWS Shield, which is you pay a lot more, and you get a human team that can help you in times of trouble. Oh, no, we're under attack some smart experts will step in. And these tools are also focused on visibility, which means that you see the waves, the flows, the tsunamis, the currents of attack. Because attacks usually do not come as just bang, one attacker getting in. There are cases where the, like in a movie where the guy has a hoodie on, uh, for some reason he's sitting in his basement in a hoodie, and <laughs> he goes click, click, and he kind of is breaking in, and he breaks into your system. That does occur. But in real life, very often, these are semi-automated or fully automated. You see the bots are coming, more bots, more bots. So you can 
work with this, not just as an attack, but as a pattern. They'll provide you third-party named address lists because they know that attackers often come from a certain, such as a Tor gateway, and other types of intelligence and machine learning based adaptive protection. The ML services exist in many cases in the basic package, but this gets far more sophisticated if you want that. The problem with event services is not just they're expensive, but that the complacency issue is still a threat. Still, if you are going to get a DDoS, do it now, not at the usual time, which is after the hackers are already hammering you. And then you call your account manager, you say, we need it now, we need it now, it's probably too late. I do suggest you prefer your own cloud's wet WAF. You can use one from a third party supplier, that's fine. I don't work for Google or Amazon. But the thing is that your HTTPS is probably being decrypted anyway. So in this way, only one company is seeing your HTTPS not another outside company. Less points of, fewer points of attack. And although they're different payment systems that I'm not gonna get into, remember that when you chose a WAF, you might find yourself going for months, years, not really using it. Well, in that case, you probably shouldn't use it at all, but you don't wanna just dive into a big expensive contract. So to summarize, the minuses of a WAF are complacency in resources and skills and mindset. You need the security mindset. You don't want a security blanket will distract you from that. Whatever, whatever degree of effort you plan to put into it, at least that one person who's supervising. False positives that drive your product manager crazy because they blocked actual users. And false negatives, which means you let the hacker through. <laughs> What's the point? And it adds risks and it may slow things down. If correctly done, it won't slow it down a lot, but you have to think about that. The pluses of a WAF are that it's easier than doing it yourself, and who doesn't want a third party solution? You don't need to change code, although you should be changing your code to make it better and fix it. It's centrally controllable. That's a very specific bureaucracy oriented, organization oriented concept of having a security department that's separate from the different departments if it's relevant to you, only in a large company. And features that you will never provide, such as adaptive protection with machine learning and DDoS that requires a lot of muscle, a lot of power. When a million attackers are hammering you, you need someone who's bigger than you to help. But in conclusion, security is job zero. It's your job. It must live inside of your application with correct security practices. You cannot just hand off responsibility and calm down. You have to always be on your toes. But yes, there are some cases where you should use a WAF. So this last slide I'm gonna leave up so you can scan it with QR. And there is a easy URL so you can see the slides and the links within it. My job is great, you heard how great it is. So you're certainly welcome to write me if you think you wanna work and do it. And now I'd like to hand it over to you for questions. Any questions? Yes, uh, please, in back. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So the question is, can you do it any, uh, could you do this for any element in the supply chain? No, I don't think so. There's a lot of good software out there that do doesn't uh, create complacency. I mean, nothing's perfect in this world. I, every single piece of software is imperfect, I know that. But if you're using an Nginx proxy, so a proxy is your request. Sometimes it crashes. It might have security bugs, I don't know. But it doesn't make you say, oh, we handle that and ignore something that you really cannot ignore. If you have, uh, I don't know, any other piece of software in the world, a database, it can crash, it can get corrupted. You need to be aware of those things. But your Postgres database is not something that makes you say, oh, it's handling my data, therefore I can forget about data. It's, it does what it does. It has very important services for you. So no, I think the WAF is very special. Uh, look, even if you talk, let's say, a uh, static, I'm giving an example from the world of security, a static code scanner. Uh, it scans for you know, vulnerabilities in your code. I, I don't know, but in my experience, it's not something that makes people say, oh, I don't have to worry about code quality anymore. If I put in something, if I put my AWS key, then I, I don't care. I don't care, because the code scanner will find that. I've never heard anybody say that. Uh, but I absolutely have people who say, oh, it's a WAF that handles web security. 
No, no, I do think it's different. Okay, it's good to disagree. No, I, of course I chose this topic because it's controversial. So, yes. <laughs> Any other questions, please? Uh, yeah, there's a... Anybody else have any questions? Talk about a WAF. Maybe you had a good experience with WAF. Maybe it was the very best thing for your application. Or any other topics that you have about security for your web application. Oh yeah, uh, if you do. Uh, actually, I'd, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear the uh, positive story about a WAF. Not for DDoS, because I already agree with you about DDoS. But somebody else will say, Boy, we were being hacked every Tuesday, and then I put up a WAF, WAF and then we weren't hacked, and I don't know, whatever that story might be. Which again, for if you have a cache, and then somebody tells me it was slow, but then it's fast because of the cache, that's a cache story, right? But a WAF story would be, we were provably insecure, and then we were provably more secure. But so, uh, any more questions? Well, okay, so thank you very much, everybody. It was great being here.